Hi, my name is Rod Cleef, and I'm the host of the Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing Podcast. And every week I interview multifamily rock stars, and we talk about how they've built incredible wealth for themselves and their families through multifamily properties. So hit the like and subscribe buttons to get notified every Monday when a new episode comes out. Let's get to it. Welcome to another edition of How to Build Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef, and I'm thrilled that you're here. I'm actually interviewing two guys today, two, two super knowledgeable guys in the development space. Their names are Nick Earls and Eric DiNicola, and uh, they are, um, uh, their company is Wing, uh, Winter Spring Capital, and they've got lots of experience in commercial development. In fact, Nick wrote, wrote a book called Making Millions Through Multifamily Development. They've got a lot of projects on the table right now, and I'm super excited to dig in. Welcome, guys. Hey, thanks, thanks so much us. for having us. Absolutely. So maybe you could each take turns just kind of talking a little bit about how you got into this business, how you got started, how you got to where you are now. And uh, maybe Nick, you go ahead and start and then, uh, and then Eric, and then, and then, we'll, then we'll get into some questions. Sure. Yeah. So Eric and I have been friends almost 20 years now, met each other in high school. Um, always kind of thought we didn't want to work for someone else. You know, we had a, like a little rebellious streak in us from a young age, um, played football together, played video games together, a lot of team oriented stuff growing up. Um, and we just had this idea, you know, we'll, we'll do a business someday. Um, went our separate ways in college and I got my real estate license in 2011 and I was selling kind of smaller apartment buildings in Massachusetts and Connecticut. And I said to Eric, Hey, this might be the Avenue, like getting into real estate investing. And we originally had the plan of just buying, you know, a smaller rental and just kind of getting, you know, the traditional way most people do it. Um, but as I, you know, was getting more and more into being a real estate agent, I saw an opportunity in condominium development in Boston, um, huge supply shortage and a lot of demand. Um, and we did our first project in 2015, been doing condo development ever since. Nice, nice. Now, you, you said you got your real estate license. Um, were you doing anything else? Uh, you seem very analytical, just the way you communicate. And, <laughs> and, you. And, and, and you don't seem like a sales person. And no. I don't mean that in any sort of a judgmental, it's just an observation. So were you doing anything else besides the real estate at that time? No, um, yeah. just real estate. Hmm. Only a couple sales a year, but okay. you know, Selling apartment buildings. I was living with my parents to save money um, in gotcha. my early 20s and okay. just trying to save up as much money as I could. Um, and on the commercial side, I, I agree. I'm not a salesman. Uh, I was always kind of a path to making some money and, and getting into real estate in another way was how I viewed it. Well, but, if, you're, um, if you're doing commercial, then, you know, that's that's a lot of analysis. So so exactly. now I get it. I, I In my head, I was thinking residential so that I wouldn't have asked the question if I'd have realized that that you were doing commercial. So so got it. Now I totally got it. You know, and, and guys in the commercial real estate space, obviously brokers have to do a pro forma on a deal. They have to analyze the deal. They have to, you know, analyze it to the point where they can properly put a valuation on it, for example, and things of that nature. So now now I get it. All right. Super. How about you, Eric? Yeah. So, you know, as Nick said, back since, uh, since high school, it's when we met each other, we had this idea, went our separate ways. I was after college, I worked in New York city. Um, I did a little public equity. Then I worked for a company who dealt with private equity firms. So I was kind of jumping all over the finance world. That's what I ended up going to school for. Um, I had to move back up here at one point and, and I met with Nick, you know, we were still, you know, great friends talking all the time. And he said, look, I think I kind of, I kind of found something here. He'd been in it for a little while. Um, found this early project once he kind of discovered that Boston had this kind of condo development uh, play um, where people were very interested in condos. The price per square foot on the sellout side was was continuing to rise, nowhere near what it is now, even six, right. seven years ago. But um, And uh, he found this property that was a two-family. This is all it was originally, two-family zone for three, figured out, okay, we could actually add a unit here, uh, sell it as three individual condos. And that kind of he, he convinced me. We saved up a bit, um, bought that first property and, and kind of continued to roll it from there. And, and you know, I was kind of, uh, you know, his love at first sight once he uh, convinced me of the project. I, I, love, it. I love it. 
I love it. You know, it, 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 I was just in Boston two weeks ago with my wife and we did the whole Faneuil Hall thing and, oh, nice. you know, and all that. And we drove up to Maine and spent a couple of days up there and love, love Boston. My, my dad used to live there and in Worcester. Uh, near oh, really? Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, Worcester. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so so uh, um, and, and I was pointing out that, 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 you know, you guys call them two families up there here. You know, they're duplexes everywhere else. But you call them two families and three families. And I was showing them to her, you know, how they're stacked right on top of each other. And I remember my dad lived in a in a three family at one point. Um, where, where literally each floor is a different family. And, and you don't see that at really m- at much else other than the Northeast. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, that was just kind of funny. Just when you said two family, it triggered that we were just there and I was pointing them out to oh, her. Um, but uh, anyway, um, so, okay. So you started small, you did, you, you found out, you found a little one. I know you, you said you're doing your biggest one now, but, uh, and I was going to dig into whether or not that was an infill situation. So it was, a, you scraped it and just put up uh, three units then is what you did. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So that okay. was kind of a dilapidated two family right. and zone and code by right allowed us to add a third unit. Saw the opportunity there, just do- dove in. A lot of projects we do, we act- we actually have to get special permission mm. um, during the entitlement process. But for that first one, we didn't. Fantastic. Fantastic. And so did either of you have any general contracting experience or was it like, did you hire a GC? Did you become a GC? How did you handle that piece of it? Yeah, my brother's actually a carpenter. um, Mm. And so he was a partner with us on the project and he got his GC license specifically Mm. to do this project, you know, studied for the test and everything. Fantastic. Yeah, that's not an easy test. And you've got to have some experience and everything else associated with it. So it's not the easiest thing to do if you haven't planned for it and prepared for it. Okay. And um, so uh, you did that one. um, And then did you do a few of those, uh, those two to three family conversions? Did you kind of start a model or, or did you go bigger right away? Talk about, talk about your progression a little bit. Yeah, we tried to um, go, you know, tried to double that size. We ended up doing a few other ones in the area, like seven units. Um, So it's not, you know, the building wasn't too much larger, maybe two to three times the size, but we squeezed in seven units, tried to fit it in with the neighborhood. That's sort of a strategy that we'll we'll work with on our architect, just because you get a lot of pushback. If you don't do that, you still Mm -hmm. get pushback from the neighborhood, but you try to do what you can. So we did, we tried to jump up to that simultaneously. We did another what ended up being two large townhouse units in a, in a city right outside Boston, Mm -hmm. um, which was sort of a a big fight. Um, We can kind of get into that later, but um, that was a large project, even though it ended up being two units, there's several thousand square feet a piece. So they're, you know, um, well over a million dollars each. And actually an investor ended up buying those. So and renting them, you know, their condos. So, you know, we kind of, at the beginning, we tried to roll everything in um, ourselves and, and maybe then take on two projects at once and three. Um, but at that stage, it was still kind of our own money, our own capital. Um, we had to wait really until one was done to jump into the next. Um, so that was kind of how it started early on. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I, 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 you know, before we started recording, you told me, you know, all the different things that you guys have going right now, which was pretty impressive. I think you mentioned a 32 unit. Um, why don't you speak to that? I don't, I, rather than me tell, repeating what you told me, why don't you talk about these different projects that you have going right now? Uh, so start with the 32 unit at what stage is that one? So that one we're closing on it next week, actually. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so it's 32 residential units. There'll be luxury condos. It's in a neighborhood of Boston called Brighton, right outside of Cambridge, five minutes from Harvard and MIT. Life sciences industry is huge there. Um, lots of new development going on, billions of dollars in that area. So that project um, is a very top of the market price per square foot sellout sort of project. We'll be getting anywhere from 900 to 1000 bucks a foot um, wow. when we're selling those units on the other well, end. Let me ask you a question in light of what you just said. Um do you have multiple exit strategies or is the only exit strategy sale? And the reason I'm asking is I went through the crash in 2008. I lost $50 million. And the people that got hurt the most were the ones that were doing the high-end development when the music stopped. And now some of them, you know, survived, like some of the players in Miami, um, you know, they would just, they just rented the condos until they could 
pull it back out. Um, is that viable for you guys or do these have to sell? Because, uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I feel like we're frothing a little bit right now. And, and, and you know, this current administration, the White House, God bless them. Oh, my God. I, I, the, some of the moves they're making just make the hair on the back of my neck stand up. And I think it's inevitable that it's going to impact the economy. We're certainly inflation, which, of course, helps us as renters. Uh, I mean, as landlords, uh, but but um, doesn't help anybody else. But um, but. You know, if, if things aren't selling and, and financing dries up, which in 08 and 09, it was like a light switch went off. You, I, I tried to sell my portfolio at about 35 cents on the dollar and I couldn't sell it. So my question again is, is do you have any, what's your thoughts on that? Just, just speak to that a little bit. And you may completely yeah. disagree with me. And that's great if you do. It's fine. Okay. No, we, we, we do agree with you on that. And we, and we want to have a, a, an, an additional exit strategy. A lot of the guys we've been working with as far as financing this project, they want that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, probably a similar background. They understand, you know, what happened, mm -hmm. uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So right. they um, we've had to model the building as rentals. There's mm -hmm. very high end rentals in the area that can, that can really achieve a, a good price per square foot on a rental basis. Uh, four or five bucks a foot. So in that building, um, we figured out, you know, what the NOI could be at that at that level, if that were to happen, what the value of the building would be based on the current cap rates. But as we know, they're pretty low. So if, mm -hmm. uh, especially right there, you're talking They'll change. just They'll under change. four, right. you know, right. so we're, we kind of modeled it as uh, in case cap rates expand a bit. And if we had to rent it, could it still work? Um, and it's uh, it's not quite as attractive as it would be uh, as our pro form with the condos, but it can work. So but it we breaks have even. that as a backup. Listen, yeah, all you got to do is break even, even, guys. That's it. You know? and, and, and Okay. So, so okay. Well, that's really good to hear. I, I, I hated to ask the question because I was afraid I was, I might be backing you into a corner, but I, I had question. to just because, you know, uh, it, it was the, that, that, uh, you know, that demographic or, of, of, or, or that type of construction that really got their asses handed to them in 2008, 9, and 10. So um, I'm really pleased to hear that. Um, so I, so that's the 32 unit. That sounds super exciting. I, I, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm congratulations on Thank that. You. It sounds like a lot of fun. Um, so now the, um, you're also doing some affordable housing. One of, please, please speak to that. Yeah, actually, right before the interview, we were uh, on the horn with the city talking about the project. So that is a smaller job, seven units. Mm -hmm. um, it's funded through city funds. Oh, nice. And they're going to be home ownership units similar to the condos we sell. Um, oh, a nice. lot of a lot of people are used to affordable housing with LIHTC and um, mm -hmm. rentals. There's not as many funds available for home ownership on an affordable basis, but the city of Boston is very proactive with this part of their policy. So they have these funds. They'll put out what are called RFPs, request for mm -hmm. proposal. Um, mm -hmm. And you just kind of say, hey, I can do this with the lot, or maybe they already have plans and you just give them, hey, I can do it for X amount. You know, this is my budget. Um, and then they'll select you based on your background and your team. So we were selected for this project. It's the first one we've done. Um, we're still in the permitting phase, but mm. since we're working with the city, that's obviously a lot smoother than when you're doing. Oh, it sure, your own. and they want it so bad. There's such a huge need. What are the margins like, though? I mean, it, you can you make some money? I mean, obviously you, you're not in this to be completely altruistic. Uh, what 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 is that looking like? And you don't have to give me detail, but I mean, does it look like the deals will make sense and you'll 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 make a decent profit on them as well? So actually how it works with this program is um, what you're allowed to sell them for at the end is actually less than the maximum you could sell it for is less than what it costs to build. So you would take a massive loss at, at that rate, but you get the subsidy makes up that difference. And then you take a developer fee based on the percentage okay. of that. So that's where you as a development firm make the capital. So you take your development fee. Okay. Yeah. So it's not yeah. like a, like a flip or anything like that, where you've got some, some extra margin in there. So it's good work guys. I mean, that's that, that talk about needed. It's absolutely needed, especially in Boston. Good guy. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Well, that's awesome. Well, the one I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to hear about is, is, is this conversion. Talk about that, this, this, this office building to uh, apartments, because, you know, I get that. I get asked that all the time. What if I buy a hotel and convert it or buy an office building, convert it? And I've got, you know, uh, ex partner that's that's doing a, a office building conversion right now. Big one in uh, in Cleveland. Um, but uh, talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So this is kind of a new strategy for us, but it's mm -hmm. 
we've been slowly building up kind of a rental portfolio with our own money. Um, now we have a, an investor base we build up from our development jobs. And we thought, why don't we tackle some of these Massachusetts and, and the Northeast in general used to be kind of a man- manufacturing hub in the late 1800s, a lot of old office space. Um, in addition to that, you have a lot of outdated zoning codes where you'll have kind of a major corridor of a city with a lot of vacant office space that would be much better suited as mixed use residential with retail on the first floor. So mm-hmm. that's kind of, that's what I just described is what we're pursuing here. Um, it's a smaller office building, uh, just to kind of How get many square used feet? to the, Do you know off the top of your head, Eric? Yeah, about it's about fifty thousand if you include okay. the basement, which he has tenants so, in. So, so, so you you put retail on the first floor. I mean, that's that's I mean, that's a fantastic successful model. Uh, retail on the first floor, and then the apartments above. Any idea of how many units you'll be able to get in? Have you modeled that out yet? We're working through it with our architect right now. We were actually speaking with him this morning, okay. um, but it's looking like somewhere around you know. 20 to 30 ish units, um, residential, possibly some office tenants on the second floor, depending on how mm-hmm. we can configure the building. Okay. Um, cause there's just, you know, there's a lot of nuances, like one, one side of the building is directly abutting another building. Mm-hmm. So you can't have window spaces there, which is a no go for residential. So there's right. a little, we got to work through all these things, but, um, mm-hmm. yeah, it's an exciting project. And I think it's a very, it's just a way that we feel our skills could, you know, usefully add value. And then we could hold these things for the long term. Well, it'd be a lot of fun just to, just to play around with it, look at it, you know, what could we put in that space that would be cool, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, we'll, we'll throw some Amazon lockers there and maybe we'll put right. something on the roof where, you know, they can sunbathe or whatever. I mean, I, I can just, I can see the, the, the fun in doing a project like that and really, you know, uh, playing around with, you know, m- you know, make figuring out how to maximize that that space that's a, got a black, you know, a wall right there, and and how to, you know, turn that into an asset, as it were. So you're 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 able to put your creative hat on, and that's not, that sounds exactly. like a lot of fun, frankly. Yep. So um, so you wrote your book, Making Millions Through Multifamily Development, Nick. Um, tell tell us for, talk about the book for a minute. So the book just goes through exactly how we get those condo buildings permitted, financed, uh, built, and sold the whole process. Um, Mm. One thing I should mention is in a lot of these cities like Boston or New York City or San Francisco, where condos are a viable strategy, can make some good money in condo space, there's a lot of red tape, Mm. um, which, you know, supply and demand, there's a supply shortage because of the red tape. If you're able to scale those barriers, you can make some money. So I go through how we've worked through some really hard permitting process in Boston, probably one of the more difficult cities in the country. Oh, sure. Boston, New York, and San Francisco. I mean, you just named the three toughest cities. And I mean, respectfully, I won't invest in a blue state. Okay. I I just, I, it just too painful, too much red tape. I I mean, it's not a political thing. It's a, Hey, it's a, it's a brain damage thing for me. And so, uh, you know, uh, you just named the three really worst ones in my opinion, but uh, you know, so that really, you know, if you can do it there, you can freaking do it anywhere. Right. And that's, you know, that's, that's the, that's the plus side of that. So um, no, that sounds like a hell of a resource. So those of you interested in doing some development, uh, you know, that sounds like a hell of a resource. So, so um, what's next for you guys? Are you thinking, continuing to go, you, you want to build to hold, which is obviously my podcast is Lifetime cash flow. You know, yep. anyone that we were talking about my, my, uh, my first interview with Albert Barris and how I forgot to hit the record button. And, and I remember he said something to me, and I've heard that from a lot of other super successful investors like, like him is they regret every deal they ever sold. And so, you know, you guys have been in the buy and sell mode. Um, now you're thinking buy and rent and develop some cash flow. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. that's actually exactly what we're thinking because yeah. of that. That reason is, uh, yeah. you know, we're still younger guys, so we don't have a ton of background to say, oh, we sold all these buildings. But mm-hmm. it's yeah, it's nice. We make a great return in a short period of time on these condos. But it would be nice to add to our strategy, which we're doing here, something where we can hold on to. It's tough yeah. in Boston with all the yeah. red tape. Oh, I know. Prices. 
you know? Yeah, no, I know. I've got, I've got a student, super successful student there that just retired from a really high paying W2 job that, that owned a bunch of two and three families in Boston. Now he's done thousands of units syndicating. And um, uh, so I, I know the market, uh, you know, again, I told you guys, my dad lived in, in, in Worcester, um, and, and somewhere else in Boston as well. And that three family that was somewhere else in Boston, it wasn't in Worcester, but, uh, yeah, no, I, uh, it's, a it's a, it's a tough market, but it's a very, it can be very lucrative. Obviously you guys have done yep. really well with it. Um, so is the plan, I'm sorry, I kind of didn't ask the question. I tried to ask it and then I kept talking. What, what is the plan? Is the plan to go larger? Is the plan to continue to do some of these, you know, medium sized projects like this 30 unit or is just whatever comes along, you're, you're all over it. What are, what are your thoughts? Maybe more office buildings. I, I'm just curious. Yeah. That's the, we, we really want to focus on these office conversions. Yeah. If we can yeah. build, build to hold right outside Boston where there's a demand for it and focus on these office buildings because it, the city we're working in outside Boston for this office conversion, they welcome developers. They want you to come in, fix these buildings. Whereas Boston, it's, it's almost like they, they fight you at every turn and you have to, you know, claw yeah. to, to really get your building up. Now that makes such a huge difference. If the city's on board or the county's on board, you know, it's, it's so much easier. And, and, you know, I know entitlement is such a pain and, 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 you know, and you're dealing with the neighbors and so on and so forth. And if there's, you know, if there's a, a decent inventory of these old office buildings, you know, you guys could do this model for years and, and, and super exactly. successfully. So, uh, you know, I, I was hoping that you'd say that because that absolutely makes good sense. Now, is there a path of progress? I mean, are you seeing, are you seeing renovations happening? You know, cause you know, or like a gentrification, for example, cause I'll give you an example. I, I, I own a lot of property in Denver back in the day. This is, you know, 40, 40 years, yeah, 40 years ago. And, uh, and um, there were there were blocks that I could buy for twenty thousand dollars a house, and now they're a million a house. Okay, and so you know I don't know if any of that's happening. Maybe you can speak to that. It is it, can you see things improving? You, and, and you want to be on the other side of it. You want to be in the in the in the zone that's like eh, it's still a little sketchy, but it's headed that direction. Is that just speak to that if you would? That's pretty much what we're going for. We're yeah. looking at. Um, Massachusetts, what they're called gateway cities, mm. uh, former manufacturing hubs. A lot of them in previous decades got really rough mm -hmm. and some of them are still pretty rough and right. some of them have through, you know, good governance recovered quite a bit. Uh, this particular office conversion we're looking at is in a city like that where it's, they've dropped their crime rates by like 50% since the nineties. So um, they're now like, actually a pretty safe community, but they still kind of have that reputation, a little bit of a, a discount on the price, mm -hmm. higher cap rates. But um, we see that it's right outside Boston. It's in the major area, has commuter rail access, which is a big thing oh, in the, with yeah, the traffic nice. here, mm -hmm. transit oriented. So we do see it as definitely in the path of progress. And, and nice. prices are rising, of course. Nice, nice. Well, you know, when you when you start seeing the artists come in, you see the coffee shops, you see all the eclectic, you know, the, those kinds of things coming yep. in. That's a really positive sign. Great I tell sign. this story. I tell this story about this house in Denver that I that I flipped. I I, I paid fifty six, sold it for seventy six. This is in late eighties, and the market crashed. Bought that same house back for eighteen. Okay, wow. I sold it a few years later for one sixty. Then it gentrified. This is an old 1800s built home. It's worth a million now. I was like, you know, it's like wow. insane. Yeah. <laughs> yep. it's, it's, uh, uh, 30th Avenue off of Federal in Denver. Yeah. Anyway, crazy. Wow. But uh, yeah. Well, how exciting, guys. I mean, what you're doing is, 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 it really gets my juices going because the, the creativity involved, you know, the, the, the really looking at something and seeing what it can be. You know, my business isn't that. My business, this is why it's kind of exciting to have this conversation. My business is buy something existing, add value, you know, and when we, kick ass with that, obviously, but, but uh, it, it doesn't have the level of creativity that you can have when you're really molding an asset like you guys are doing. So that's very, very cool. Um, well, listen, um, so let's say somebody wants to get into this and they want to develop, they want to build, obviously they should get your book uh, for those condo conversions, but uh, um, you know, what advice would you give someone that, that, that maybe has a little bit of background? They've, they've done some, some real estate. Maybe they've done some construction work. They own some property um, and they, they, they feel like they want to start in this business. What, what would you say to them? 
Yeah, I would say we kind of always say this, you got to take the leap. If if you get stuck in kind of an analysis paralysis mode, we were known to do this at the beginning. We'd look at a deal a hundred times and you want to be careful. You don't want to just jump into something because, oh, here's the first one. Let's jump into it. But we notice a lot of people we have worked with that we've almost kind of surpassed in terms of the size projects we're doing. They're still doing smaller ones and say, well, you know, we just haven't found the right one. We think, well, there's a lot of opportunity out there. You, mm-hmm. you, sometimes you can't really learn or see that until you do it. And yeah, that's a risk, but I, I think you have to take a few risks at that stage. It'll help, it'll teach you how to do it and you'll begin to feel more comfortable. You'll analyze to, you know, you won't analyze to this level of paralysis anymore and, and you'll see the fruits of your labor all of a sudden. And you got to put that creative hat on. You've got to see That's the right. vision as well, which is, you know, maybe a little harder for an analytical person. I don't know because I'm not analytical, but but I would think maybe it would be. Um, well, um, uh, well, oh, God, I was going to say something about that and I lost it. Ah, darn it. It's never pretty when you lose your mind. Oh, that's right. That's right. So, um what are some pitfalls that they should watch out for? What are, what are some things, you, you know, I'm sure you've got some failures that set you up for future success. We all do. We fail our way to success. What are some, what are some you know, bloody noses that either you got or you could suggest that they pay attention to so they don't make some mistakes? What are some thoughts there? Yeah, I think um, with development, especially when you're building those red tape, high price cities, mm-hmm. um, be very careful about the neighbors and the neighborhood and what the city wants, regardless of what the law says. So we had a project in a, uh, a densely populated um, affluent city right outside of Boston called Somerville. Mm -hmm. And the project that we were pursuing should have been allowed as of right by the zoning code. We don't need any special permission. We just needed to go through a historical review process on the property And even if they deem it to be historical, it was just what's called a demolition delay. You have to wait a few months, work Mm -hmm. through potential options. Maybe someone will truck it off site. The the neighbors were very anti-development. And that historical board, for some reason, just whoever wrote the laws wrote it strangely. They have a lot of power randomly. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't even think that was intended, but they do. Mm -hmm. And we should have known early on when we were getting into that, how much resistance there was, even though the law said one thing, all these people against us, we just kind of were blissfully ignorant going into it. What they ended up doing is they actually changed the zoning code. They rallied the neighborhood and changed just that street that we were on, which is actually illegal. It's called spot zoning, but we we would have had to sue the city. And obviously we're not capable of doing that. So um, we were actually able to salvage the project we, we brought in a, a former politician and a zoning attorney working with in a lot of projects. We were able to get a smaller project built, but um, that was, you know, be very careful. If, if the neighbors have power, if random historical boards for some reason have all this power, be careful, listen to what they're saying, listen to look at the places where they allow development. Don't just go, you know, don't try to swim upstream. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's really good advice. Listen, um, you know, you guys added t- tremendous value. Is there any t- is there any area of your business that you want to touch on? Because again, it's not something I've done, so I, I can't speak too intelligently about it. I know entitlement's a pain in the ass, but is there any other part of the business? You no, know, here's one. What, what, how are you dealing with the construction pr- uh, price of materials? You know, what's happening there and how has that impacted what you're doing? Please speak to that for a moment because that's a big one. That's a good question. Very relevant, obviously, to us and and other builders over the last year, year and a half. Um, One thing, you know, lumber, for example, is a massive component of anything you build. It's really the largest component. So we we've kind of lucked out that we had some orders in and started construction on some of the current projects almost before that was taking off. And then it started to come back to earth at least recently. Um, we've locked in some prices that are more expensive than they've been, but we still, we found a way to make them work within the project. Um, we used a little more uh, last year, a little more metal in some areas and sort mm-hmm. of, you know, steel, which now the coincidentally that's now going up and that's up. Um, so we're trying to now limit that. Um, so there's ways around it, but it, like, you know, Nick was talking about supply and demand at the beginning. It's sort of, it has its effects, you know, in the end, right. it, prices are going to go up on some of these units. 
Um, prices are, you know, continuing sort of to go up everywhere though, as we talked about, maybe we're kind of frothing a bit, um, mm-hmm. but it does affect the end game. It affects how much we could sell these units for. It affects the margin a bit. Um, we're fortunate enough that we've been able to make it work, but it's certainly been a struggle. Yeah. You know, you see these memes of a little pile of scrap wood on the side of the road, like t- treasure found and, you know, funny stuff because wood has been so, or I forgot there was one meme where somebody's in Home Depot and, oh God, and I, I'm going to botch it, but it's hilarious about, you know, uh, about uh, the cost of, of, uh, of wood right now. But, uh, well, listen, uh, I, I appreciate you guys coming on. It's been a real treat and it's been a whole lot different conversation than we normally have on this podcast. And so, uh, you know, uh, if you guys uh, want to learn more about development, get Nick's book, Making Millions Through Multifamily Development. Nick, Eric, I appreciate you guys being on. It's a pleasure to meet you. And uh, um, thanks. Thanks for being here. Likewise. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you, on. Rod. Very exciting. Rod, I know a lot of our listeners are wanting to take their multifamily investing business to the next level. Now, I know you've been hard at work helping our warrior students do just that using our ACT methodology, which is awareness close and transform. Can you explain to the listeners how they can get our help? You bet. Guys, we've been going nonstop for three years, building an amazing community of like-minded people. And our coaching students, which we call our warriors, have had extraordinary results. They've purchased thousands and thousands of units. And last year, we did over a thousand units with our students. And we're looking to grow this group and take it to the next level. We're looking for people who want to follow a proven framework that's really step-by-step and then leverage our systems and network to raise equity, to find and close deals, and to build partnerships nationwide. Now, our warrior community is finding success in any market cycle. So, if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become more of our incredible network and take advantage of the incredible opportunities that are coming very soon, apply to work with us at mentorwithrod.com or text CRUSH to 72345 and we'll set up a call so you can check us out and we can check you out. That's mentorwithrod.com or text CRUSH to 72345.